we have time for questions if you'd like. Um, you said that you've altered the treatment protocol? Yes. Uh, it's evolved. How has it evolved and what are you doing now? So the, the, uh, the I, bet, I guess the biggest evolution is um, at the very beginning it was unclear how many passes were necessary in order to, to get optimal outcomes. And, and right now it appears that a single treatment with two passes um, is giving us the best result. Do you repeat the treatment? So um, it, it's an interesting question in the, in the months, study that we months, have. Or? Yeah, in the study that we have um, that we're getting ready to start, the way that we've set up the protocol is this. We, we have them come in for the initial treatment, and then we have them follow up with us every six months. And uh, the way that the study is, is structured is if we don't see a significant barrier of clear nail at that six month point, then the plan is to retreat them. And so this will help us to build the, the database to answer that question. Do you have any idea of uh, the, the difference in success rates if, if you do a touch up or retreatment? Uh, like I'm doing it at four months. Right. Uh, is there a difference in success rates? As far as the time period is concerned? Yeah, if you do the touch up in four months you as know, opposed to the one treatment. It's interesting because when we were designing the study, we went back and forth about should we do the, the, the check at three months or wait till six months. And I think um, in an office setting, three to four months makes more sense than waiting until the six month mark. Um, for a research perspective, um, we really don't want to do the repeat treatment unless at six months, if we don't see a clear area, in my mind, that's probably going to be a patient that fails treatment. So it gives me another crack at getting a good outcome. But I think in a private practice situation, if you're not seeing at least three three millimeters of clear nail after three months, I think that's an optimal time to do a touch-up. Mm -hmm. Does that go through like nail polish, if they have nail polish on, or you know? Yeah, no, you know, lasers, although it's lasers have heating, some, right? well, but lasers um, yeah. heat tissue selectively based on color primarily. They get absorbed by tissues of a certain color is how they are selected for fungus and bacteria, and they don't destroy the surrounding skin. So if you introduce a barrier of color between the surface of the nail and the, and the nail bed, then uh, you run the risk of greatly diminishing the, the effectiveness and also possibly even heating up the, the surface of the nail rather than the space between the nail and the nail bed where the fungus resides. So uh, my personal recommendation would be um, better to do it without nail polish um, and I think I would even uh, suggest if you, if you have patients that are coming in that you have them take the nail polish off before they come in so that if you have to wipe it again, this some nail polish remover, it's, it's already been thinned out substantially. And debride the nail too on those really thicker ones? or no? I, I like to debride it, not because I'm worried about the nail being penetrated by the fungus. I'm, I like to debride it because I think it decreases the fungus burden. So the, the more you get off the surface, the less you have to kill. Right. So uh, irregardless of penetration of the nail, I still like the idea of the priming. You do fungus culture before you do this. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons that you get thick nails other right. than fungus. Okay, I mean, what do you, I, I'm sorry, what, what do you do to you know, the person that comes in with one of the club nails? I mean, everybody walks right. in the office thinks that with thick nails thinks they automatically have fungus. Right, And they right. want a treatment. So how do you handle that and, you know, what's the, uh, you know, protocol as far as, you know, somebody comes in with the big ram's horns nails and had it for 20 years and they expect a cure from the laser. I, I um, if I have some doubt that it's not fungus, then I usually do culture them. Um, the, the other thing is that um, a lot of the patients that come in have already um, had a story to tell me about Lamisil. They've said, you know, I had culture, I had Lamisil, it worked, you know, initially it worked good and then I've got the fungus back. Um, so, that story um, is very, very common, and that tells me that most likely it is fungus. But if I doubt, I, I certainly do culture. See, in my mind, there's a difference between having a white nail. And ha I mean, a white nail means Absolutely. the nail blade's lifted. So, I mean, yeah. I have athletes that'll come in that do propulsive sports, tennis, racquetball, whatever, and yeah, their nails get white because of trauma. But they tell me, well, it's fun, you know, it's fungus. Right. And I took Lamisil, and it came back. So, what do you, I mean, what do you, I mean, are you going to use it on something like that? And then one other question is: Is it safe for diabetics? Right. So, so a couple of things. Um, um, I have used it on patients that had yeasts that had negative fungal cultures, and it and it, it works well. Laser works well for yeast as well. So, so that's good. That especially that superficial white black type, right. um, that works very well for that. Um, 
you know, clearly there's people that come in with trauma to the nail, and this isn't going to, to do anything for them. So if I have if I have doubts, um, I'll try to culture it. How do you treat like a ram's horn? You know, somebody comes in with ram's horn types nails. What do you do with something like that? You mean that? if I'm considering uh, laser for Correct. them? So I would take a big hunk of that, send it in, um, do the cultures, and then uh, if it comes back something other than and uh, fungus, then I usually have a conversation with them and I say, this does not appear to be fungus. I don't expect that it's going to um, improve. Some I've had a couple that have wanted to try it anyways. Um, and uh, so far, the ones that came in that were just you know distorted nail roots that, that grow distorted toenails, right. they're, they're not going to improve from this. Um, so. uh, if you have a dark pigmented patient, would would it be difficult to treat that patient with a laser? Um, you know, there's not a specific contraindication for it, um, but darker pin pigmented um, patients, historically, from most laser treatments, have poorer outcomes, cosmetic lasers. Um, with the uh, um, clinical study that I did for Novion, we actually had a specific indication. We had a, a pigmentation chart, and we would compare their toe to the pigmentation chart. And so for the, the two darkest um, levels of pigmentation, they were actually excluded from the study specifically. Could you use it for warts? Okay, the question was, can you use it for warts? Um, uh, there's no indi there's no uh, indication for it. I'm, I'm sure that it would uh, damage the, the virus, but um, don't have any data. Because I was looking area. at the other lasers, yeah. and they were using it for the nail. They were also using it for aging spots and warts. I, I um, and I think also they use it for uh, um, fatty deposits and veins. Veins, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know. I, I'm skeptical of things that, that do too much stuff. I, my guess is uh, um, it's a uh, like the guy at the cocktail party who knows a little bit about everything and doesn't know much about one specific thing. You know, it's, it's uh, I'm sure it can do a, a reasonable job on veins and a reasonable job on pigmented lesions, but um, my guess is it's going to be mediocre in all of them. Given that so many fungal cultures come back negative and they're so unreliable, do you just use your clinical judgment? In spite of that, uh, you know, it yeah, looks like one and walks like one and smells like one, it's one, so. For the most part. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, sometimes people want to have establish absolutely, and I'll do a culture twice, and if it still comes back negative after the second one, then I use my clinical judgment. Is it safe for diabetics with uh, Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to ask that before. Is it safe for diabetics? So um, they are heat-based systems. Now they, they, they do monitor um, the heat. There's a feedback loop so that it um, can't get too hot. And so um, I think it is very safe for, for diabetics, and we use them on diabetics in our practice. Um, but you, you have to be careful because you have to remember that the more profound the neuropathy, the less likely it is that they're going to be able to tell you if something is, is not going well. So you should still be careful with somebody with impaired circulation, obviously. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there's, there's always a risk. So, um, I was going to ask Dr. Waldman to, to step up here. Um, Dr. Waldman um, has a device in his, in his uh, office and has been very successful with it. My practice is a hospital-based practice, and so my model is a little bit different probably from most people in this room, but uh, Dr. Waldman is uh, doing uh, private practice and probably has a little bit different perspective about how it fits into his uh, practice. Dr. Waldman, please.